Todd Richards here, Roots Hearts. And Soul. Stefan and I are launching this podcast based off cookbook Roots Heart and Soul by myself, Todd Richards, with a great help from Chef Stefan, the man, the myth, the legend himself. Oh, you stop, you. We have such a beautiful history together. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Really, what people are going to get from this podcast is telling the story of of Afro people, Afro cuisine. We're going to be telling the story of the Pan-African diaspora. Roots, heart, soul of the of the world, as we say. We are we launching in a couple of weeks here. Some terrific guests. Stay tuned. Follow us on all our social media at Chef Todd Richards in all formats. Chef Stefan, what's yours? Chef Stefan dot i t a y i t i. This is the correct way to say Haiti. Well, we're getting education already. So if you want to find out more, if you want to listen to great stories being told by amazing, amazing culinary talents, we're going to be hearing stories from Africa all the way to the Caribbean, all the way to the Americas. It's going to be it's going to be something special. Giving everyone a good rhythm, the good vibes. Yeah, baby. We look forward to seeing everyone. Talk soon. I'm Lou Bank. And I'm Greg Benson. And this is an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup, the critically acclaimed award-winning syrup that helps gringo bartenders better make margaritas, wait, wait, Negronis, Lou, hold and up, hold up, wait. Old Are you just... Fashions? This is how you start your podcast. What? It's not an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup. Well, of course it is. I'm just cutting costs by not paying writers to make something new. I'm just using an old script. You pay writers? Is that some kind of jab? No, I'm just saying what, that... What What are you saying? Well, look, we've got this amazing syrup that's made in an ancestral manner, cooked down from the sap of the agave, harvested the way these families would to make polke. It's a quality product. It deserves yeah, a yeah. quality presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, hang on. <clears throat> ancestral agave syrup is made by real families following traditional methods. Unlike the industrial Blue Weber syrup you get everywhere else, Ancestral is cooked down from Aguamiel, harvested from Salmiana in Hidalgo, Mexico. It is the grade A Vermont maple to the sticky diner syrup you've been using for your cocktails. Ingredients matter both in how your cocktail tastes and how you treat the earth. Ancestral is better for both. Is that good? Uh, sure. Or maybe confusing instead of cheesy. Uh, look, just visit AncestralAgave.com to learn more and to order your world-class agave syrup today. And we'll call that a wrap. Catch you next ad, Greg. Uh, Hasta pronto? Ancestral Agave Syrup. Available online at ancestralagave.org and wherever Greg and Lou are able to coerce store owners into carrying it. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The Welcome back to the Speakeasy. I'm Damon Bolte. And I'm Greg Benson. And it is 4th of July week. It's this coming Thursday, which means that nobody is going to be doing any work this whole week. Uh, Damon, you got any plans coming up? I certainly hope not. I, I don't intend to. <laughs> I'm going to do even less work than I usually do. I'm doing a little bit of work. Um, my band, the Lone Wolf Coyotes, is playing uh, this really awesome... I, you know, I, I live in West Marin County, uh, just north of San Francisco, and I'm in Lagunitas, the the birthplace of Lagunitas Brewery. Um, but there's really nothing else here. <laughs> yeah, you know, Lagunitas <laughs> moved to Petaluma, but uh, you know, it's it's a really cool, like hippie kind of area, um, kind of country and whatnot. So it totally fits my band, which is hippie country. So uh, in Woodacre, which is one of the towns, just just uh, past Fairfax, which is kind of a really cool little hippie town that has some music venues and stuff. There's this 4th of July parade every year, and it ends at this barn at the end of the road that, uh, you know, a bunch of bands play at, and all the old heads come out and do the hippie wiggle dance, and, you know, <laughs> I just have a great time. I'm, like, I, that's that's work, I guess, right? Because we're going to be playing on a flatbed 
trailer stage in the blistering sun uh, in the afternoon on 4th of July. But I'm really looking forward to eating my weight in hot dogs. Have you noticed lately, like the this this trending hot dog situation, like of gourmet hot dogs everywhere? Like you know, Rob, if you follow Robert Simonson's Substack, um, and is just his Instagram and stuff, he's like obsessed with hot dogs. I didn't think anyone could be more obsessed with hot dogs than me, but that guy certainly is. He just had PDT just put, uh, you know, Kirk Dogs just put a Simonson dog on the menu, which is the first time that a non-chef, I think, has had a hot dog on the menu. Is that correct? I, do you know about that, Craig? I, I, that sounds correct to me. I was not aware of this. I mean, that's like, I mean, I don't want to say this because uh, I know he's a friend of the show, but he's peaked. Like, there's no way that you can top that in your professional <laughs> career after that point. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful food. Uh, you know, I, you know, there's, there's so I don't want to get too deep into it because like this show will just be completely it'll turn into a hot dog show, which you know <laughs> that that might be a good spinoff from the speakeasy. Yeah. Um. But you know we'll talk about that the after easy. we get off the air. Oh. The <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. But it's it's you know it's just a it's like a perfect food palette, and I think that's why you're seeing like caviar dogs and like all this crazy shit going on in the world uh with the, the world of hot dogs so i'm like i'm here for it man but i'm i'm a, a little afraid that like you said we peaked and i don't i don't know where we can go from fancy hot dogs like I, i'm afraid to live longer than this moment i'm just living in the now because i just don't see it getting any better where it's gonna go um <laughs> i don't know I, just, I got a little dark just now but i mean <laughs> we, <laughs> but i mean just hot dogs everywhere i mean there's like a there's like a crazy hot dog at like French Laundry, you know, like that kind of shit. Like that, that's where we're at. And I'm again, I'm totally here for it. I'm just trying to live here now, man. Just trying to be here now. So hot dogs yeah. forever, hopefully. We had to we had to we had to get a little dark there because Souther is uh, is not joining us. So one of us had to exactly. be the storm cloud on this one. <laughs> but but no, like I mean, you know, people who listen to the show know that I'm a big baseball fan, and I mean, baseball and hot dogs is like that's like that's like America and apple pie right there. Like yeah. that is a that is a Fourth of July. marriage of two equals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do you call it? God's birthday. It's God's. I always call it God's birthday, uh, and that means hot dogs would be the sacrament. Um, you know, yep. for you know, it, I can't think of a more divine. <laughs> you know what? Maybe maybe this is where it goes. Maybe this is. The basis of a new religion thousands of years in the future this will be like people will have like found recordings of this mm-hmm. show after the zombie apocalypse that's coming in let's call it eight years you're say, and uh, you're saying future ancient aliens yes future ancient aliens will have discovered this ancient religion <laughs> and adopt it and hot dogs will be their holy food so that's that is where it goes from here you know we have the french laundry dog we have crypt dogs uh i was at a ballpark recently where i had a hot dog with uh chunky peanut butter relish and sriracha oh and it was delightful i did oh get it, God, it uh, forgetting that my friend i was with had a severe peanut allergy so i had to hit six, <laughs> several rows away from him to eat it but it was worth it it was delightful so yeah like maybe that's where it goes. i feel like the only place it can go from here is the realm of divinity that's the only step it's up that worth losing take. friends over <laughs> <laughs> quite literally um and you know what would go well with this this is just a brief sidebar uh i just think keeping it going yeah the perfect companion to a hot dog now exists because sunny d does a vodka soda now. I don't know if you've seen this. This is breaking news here on the Speakeasy for our listeners. But yeah, Sunny D does a vodka soda. So that is uh, uh, something that you can wash down the body of God with. Jeez. If we make it through the show without being struck dead by lightning, we're going to be, we're the lucky ones, Damon. It would have happened long ago, (laughs) Greg. Well, Um, but you know, I, I, rather than a Sunny D vodka soda with my, perfectly crafted hot dog i would rather keep it really more traditional like american and have some whiskey with it you know like that you know i hot dogs apple pie baseball fourth of july i mean american whiskey like come on yeah exactly what what other what other perfect pairing could there be and fortunately for us uh, to talk about some delicious American whiskey that they're making, we have Michelle Clark and Sienna Yevermov from Widow Jane in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's good to have you. Thanks for having us. 
So let's talk a little bit about. I gotta say this, Greg. There was like, as far as like perfect foods in divinity, that segue was probably the best one we've ever done on the show. <laughs> we've peaked. And we've... that's saying a lot. We've peaked. <laughs> this is the final episode of the Speakeasy, guys. We'll see you around. Stay tuned We're for the Eat Easy coming in 2025. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's it's lovely to have you, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, this stuff that you sent me over here. This uh, baby Jane that you just developed, which has a really, really cool backstory. Um, Coming all the way down to the uh, the heirloom corn that you developed to actually put into this bottle. So start. Let's start from the beginning. Where where did this come from? What was the impetus and take us through the the journey to make this whiskey? Well, Sienna and I both started in 2012, and we were completely in the middle of the launch of this brand, it, like just as it was launching in, in October, 2012. So by 2013, we had acquired some private whiskey stocks and we had also gotten source of limestone water upstate and we started releasing bourbon and rye. So we immediately became obsessed with the ingredients that were going into this and making it as refined and delicious and complex as possible. So we decided we needed to grow our own corn. So I called up every seed bank in the country and got one to five pound bags of heirloom non-GMO varietals. And that included Oaxacan Green, Hopi Blue, Bloody Butcher, Wapsi Valley, Bear Claw Rainbow. And there was this farmer upstate that was retiring. So he had some open fields in the back and he was willing to like just do some experimental fields for us. So it took three years to develop this uh, heirloom varietal that was proprietary to us. Um, so the first year, he just grew these like one to five pound bags and kind of had a report at the at the harvest. You know, uh, some was eaten by deer, some didn't yield very well. And the most stable of all of the fields was the Bloody Butcher and Wapsie Valley. So immediately we started distilling those as single heirloom varietals and into whiskey. And we found that the Bloody Butcher had this like really nice savory tobacco molasses flavor. Um, they're high in proteins. And then the Wapsie Valley yielded this like very sweet, um, sweeter corn, you know, kind of your typical uh, yellow dent, but nicer because it was an heirloom, um, the Wapsie Valley. So the second year in 2014, we had those two fields growing next to each other. And that's when we got a call to come up for the first harvest of harvesting our own uh, uh, baby Jane seeds. So Sienna and I went up, um, you know, at the crack of dawn in a Honda element, uh, made it to Rosendale, uh, just five minutes past it in Tilson. And we're like, as the sun's rising, drinking our coffee, we just started grazing the fields. So, you know, they're green ears and you didn't know what was what. Open air pollination made it so that the Bloody Butcher and the Wapsie Valley had these like sunburnt orange varietal in the middle. So we started harvesting like all the ears we can. And then we just threw them in baskets and boxes and drove them back to the distillery, poured them out into the floor, made a huge gradient of all the colors we had from red to yellow. And then like landed in this like two thirds near the near the Wapsie Valley, this like orange color, and then put that in a brown paper bag, uh, took a Sharpie, named it Baby Jane because it was obviously a labor of love and then gave that to our farmer for the third time. So, yeah, it's been 10 years, this labor of love of him growing it and us expanding our reach on it. And we're finally releasing it this month. To the national market for the first time. So, well, that's amazing. And I also love the, the just kind of, I mean, obviously, I don't want to say letting nature do the work for you because it was clearly a lot of human labor from the two of you that went into this. But I love the, the willingness to let this kind of natural hybridization take place and not just being very, you know, no, we're only going to use this one, like, very pure, specific varietal. I feel like that's, that's a major, um, bug in the way that we, you know, grow produce these days is we have this one thing that we like and we're like, we're going to make it exactly this way. And that's how you get crappy shit like red delicious apples and beefsteak tomatoes when really you just kind of want to let like nature do the work for you in that regard, you know? That's that's how I approach music, you know? <laughs> just, uh, I actually have an heirloom corn ear tattoo oh, on my arm because I love it so much. Um, nice. 
Yeah. So for our Patreon listeners, you can actually watch the videos of the show <laughs> and see that. Um, I have a, a lot of weird tattoos. But, you know, to me, like, you know, we talked about hot dogs being the most perfect food. But really, if you if you think about it, it's the I corn dog I, because, I you know, like <laughs> that's the hy- hybridization of gotta be the corn dog <laughs> i mean okay we again you gotta ch- you check out the eat easy uh, 2025 to learn more about that uh but so what i want to hear about is i mean a lot of things but um as far as like the process like i i was like going to a distillery and tasting the mash as it's developing right like in the fermentation process and like kind of like the beer you know of it I, I imagine just like like tasting the corn like raw and then like tasting it at, during the process must have been really fun too, right? Cool. Yeah. Can you kind of t- expand on like what that process was like and like because like a lot of times it seems like it's a lot of, a lot of trial and error, right? Because it could be good at one point and then like you know there's a famous story about Maker's Mark where you know uh, they were baking the breads with like cornbread and wheat bread and like try to figure out what it would turn into. Uh, and so what was that process like for you? Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it really was kind of, um, a little bit of yeah, real trial and error because heirloom corns, you know, had, there wasn't a lot kind of that had been really looked into. Hi, sorry. I'm recording something right now. Yeah. (laughs) The beauty of live radio, everyone. So we were, you know, heirloom corns hadn't been used by anyone who had been doing some major research in like, had been writing all the protocols that most distilleries had developed for making bourbon whiskey as we knew it. Um, so we kind of had to just sort of figure out, you know, we, it was pretty clear right off the bat that it wasn't going to react the same way to your standard dent corn that you had access to mostly for distilling. Um, you know, one of the big things is heirloom corn has a tendency to have a slightly higher like oil content. And that was kind of something we were like, how do we approach dealing with that? Right. Um, and just, you know, all these slight, you know, very small nuances were going to be really big and different um, and really to do an, the honor to the corn that you're choosing and to make really great whiskey. You had to find those slight variances um, in your cook protocols as well as your fermentation protocols and then uh, your distillation protocols to kind of work with a grain that was a little different. Um, so one of the things was that we definitely approached the corn cooks by um, trying different temps for the gelatinization of the and the um, sacrification of the corn. Um, and we kind of settled actually on a much lower temp than which was standard. Um, and that was kind of interesting. It was really kind of like tasting um, throughout the process. And even though you were getting really good results on your sugar output, your, your kind of bricks and things like that, even the way the yeast was reacting to this really lovely sweet cooked mash um, you could visually see the corn oil ring, which was kind of a little unsettling to begin with. Um, so you could then during fermentation, start to see that the flavors were a little bit more, um, funky than you were expecting to be. And then really when it was coming off the still, you were definitely getting this like overly oily flavor that started to kind of burn a little bit and stuff like that. So we really had to then go back to right to the beginning of how we were going to then cook it. Um, and so we went with the lower temps. Um, and then that can then moved us on to kind of where we were talking about what we were going to do with um, the fermentations. Um, and we kind of settled on, you know, we could run it and get these really kind of big, boisterous, um, lovely grain forward flavors. But we found that if we actually ran it a little lower and a little cooler, we were actually going to get these really great fruity flavors and really letting it mellow out. That kind of balanced into this really great fruity flavor um, that would then pass over into the still. Um, so we thought that was kind of amazing. Um, so we kind of ad- adapted that. Um, and then, yeah, finally running on the still, we kind of choose to definitely run it in a way where we're really looking for a big expression of that flavor. Um, and, and you can actually run it um, quite a while to really capture um, a lot of the, the, the umptuous flavor qualities. Um, and it was all kind of just really, you know, tasting back and forth and kind of really tracing the history and the lineage of these flavors, um, through the final products. Yeah. I mean that, so that once you've, once you've got to this point, I, I'm, I'm such a, a, a big old bundle of anxiety. Like once you've gotten to this point, I would be so, uh, 
concerned about putting it into a barrel because it's been, you know, at this point we're talking 10 years to grow this corn and all of the, the experimentation that you just walked us through Sienna. Um, what was your process for saying, okay, like now we're going to put this in a barrel. Like what was that moment like? And what was the sort of the, the, were there any uh, ways you kind of tried to, I don't want to say game the system, but sort of like, you know, set yourselves up for success at when it came time to be like, okay, we've got it to this stage. Now we kind of just need to get it over the finish line. Um, I think what it is, is you can be pretty sure that at least if you've got good whiskey going into the barrel, um, you're setting yourself up hopefully for some success. You know, bad in usually means bad out. Um, so as long as you make sure that you're kind of really up into that point, focusing and really focusing on making just really good white dog. Um, and that's another thing that I think people find very surprising when they do see, you know, and taste our white dog. It's just like how, how flavorful it really is, how really standalone in its own right it can really be. Um, so we really make sure it's loaded with flavors before we put that in there. Um, but yeah, you're, yeah. Welcome to what has been. Uh, a little aspect of like mild uh, trauma for this past couple of years that I've been distilling, <laughs> which is like tasting it as it ages and just really being hoping that we're gonna, we're doing it right. We're pulling it out the right time, that it's going to stay true to what we want it to, that it will impress people as much as it was impressing us. Um, I mean, we luckily have the ability to kind of tap into the barrels. It's not like we're like chained out of it. So we've been constantly kind of doing, um, you know, tastes along the way, but there's definitely been moments where you question yourself, you know, and you're like, you know, is this really the thing we want to say into the world? But I think overall, um, you just make sure that you are always feeling really good about every step of what you're doing. Um, and really just kind of focus on those small details and just be, as long as I am doing what is right and good in each step. I think, you know, I trust that uh, the overall outcome is going to be something glorious and great. But yeah, it's a lot of micromanaging, Anna, <laughs> basically. Because we've tried so hard to create the best ingredient possible going and carrying that like corn through the distillation, you know, not filtering it out um, in the after fermentation being able to raise our own barrels and do custom toast and char, like working closely with that Cooper, having those custom barrels sent in, and then also proofing with the limestone water, uh, bringing it to 110 when it's going in the barrel. Like it's really like combining the best resources we possibly could get our hands on to like create something that I think in the end is tasting a lot more mature than its actual age, just because those ingredients are so like refined. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that, that limestone water. And <clears throat> you're right. It, it is refined. I've, I had a chance to try it at the launch party and I thought it was really good, but I don't have to take my own word for it because I have this nice bottle right here. So I'm going to try a little bit myself right now, but I really love that feature of, of Widow Jane, the, the limestone water that you get from, uh, from upstate. Talk to me a little bit about that and just how, that came to be and what you're doing with the water that you proofed this down with in the first place? Yeah, two hours north, um, just 100 miles, is Rosendale. And this whole town is built on this limestone shelf um, that basically for 200 years, they excavated all of the cement they used to basically build New York City and thereabouts out. So Grand Central Terminal, Brooklyn Bridge, base of Statue of Liberty, Grand Central Terminal, like a lot of U.S. highways and roads, um, were all made with the clinker, the, basically the cement that went between the limestone blocks on these historic structures. Um, so if you follow the Hudson up, Rondout Creek, Rondout River comes off of that. So these caverns, basically 13 companies were excavating um, up until like the 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, Rosendale Cement. And so they'd kind of cart, they'd blast out the stone, bring it out in carts, um, put in these wells and crumble it down to this dust that they would then put in barrels and put on a barge so that ship right connected down to the ports in New York and were like the perfect supplies. So as that shut down and um, it transitioned to Portland cement, these wonderful engineering marveled like cavernous rooms filled with rainwater. 
And so it just like naturally filtered through these limestone veins and filled with this wonderful limestone water full of magnesium and calcium. So like hard water is really nice on the palate. Like when you take a hard water shower, it sticks to your skin. Um, so it's going to do the same on the palate. And what that's going to do is allow complex flavors to open up. It's going to add like viscosity, sweetness, and allow you to experience a front, mid, and a long lingering sweet finish on the whiskey, which is like something while we're blending, we like definitely lean into like, what are the flavors? And at like, what point are you experiencing those flavors and how um, uh, sweet or savory or in between are they? So that water is like such an integral part. Like it, it radically changes the roundness. Um, and yeah, so we about, you know, a couple times a month bring down tankers straight to the distillery. Um, we run it through filtration and then it gets um, blended into our small batch blends to be bottle proof. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that. I mean, one of the things that, you know, we, we overlook water a lot in the stuff that we drink. You know, we kind of, especially in the world of beer that I came from, like everybody is obsessed with like, Oh, like what hot profile are you using? Like what's the mash bill? Like what yeast are you pitching in it? But if only, 6% of your beer is alcohol. The other 94% is going to be water. That makes a huge, huge difference. And I always like to talk about the fact that bourbon is called bourbon because Bourbon County, again, built on that, like, you know, uh, a f what was a flat, shallow sea and all of the, you know, the little seashells of trillions and trillions of little organisms that existed way before we did uh, is what, created whiskey from that specific part of the world being really, really good. So I love the fact that you're sort of, uh, you know, finding a way to pay homage to that legacy and introduce an ingredient that, again, makes up a really, really big part of what's in this bottle that is, uh, that is, like you say, going to create that elongated sort of uh, uh, multi-act thing that happens when you drink the whiskey. It's very cool. Almost a barrel's worth of water goes into every blend. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a major ingredient in the spirit. Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of the origin of this particular whiskey. Uh, I want to hear about the origin story of the two of you, uh, because you both started to correct me if I'm wrong. One or both of you was originally like hired to be like at the counter in the gift shop. Am I misremembering that? That was me. That was you, Sienna. Okay, cool. But yeah, you've both been with this, uh, with Widow Jane for a really, really long time. So talk about how you sort of grew into the roles that you have now and how you've watched the company kind of grow over that time. Do you want to go first, Michelle, or should I? You go first, Sienna. I'll go first? All right. Yes, you go. Um, so yeah, so I basically was looking for a job in 2012 when I was still in um, college, uh, and I had, you know, been living in Brooklyn for quite a while now and was, would come down to Red Hook and just kind of pops around. Um, and I saw a sign on the door, um, next to this bar that I had always known Botanica. Um, I wasn't drinking, um, but I was definitely hanging out there. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I saw a sign that said, you know, help wanted, uh, and I was like, oh, all right, apply. And it was very old school, like literally just like knocked on the door, had a resume and was like, uh, how do I get a job? And they were like, uh, hold on a second. And so I gave them a resume. They disappeared. I got a call back um, and I showed up for an interview. Um, and uh, yeah, basically that's kind of how it happened. Yeah, I, they said they had another girl, but I got hired like 10, 10 hours later, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, I showed up, you know, for my first day and I thought I was going to be working kind of with a big crew. There was going to be this big training. Uh, and it was actually kind of just, just me on the weekend. Um, I kind of learned about full beans to bar chocolate, about whiskey. And it really was something that I suddenly realized that there was this really lovely, beautiful story behind. There was this amazing um, culture and science, which is something that's always really found engaging. But there's also an art and then it's also food and it's something we share. And that kind of just really like stimulated everything that uh, about me. And so I started kind of really working there. Um, and then progressively I started doing a little bit of everything. We were a really, really tiny, small company. Um, and everyone kind of just did a bit of everything. Um, there was like, no, this is not my job kind of thing. It was all just like, all right, <laughs> something new to learn, something fun to do. Um, always helping each other out, um, exploring. Um, I think I probably worked 
in every facet now of the company. I've been on the bottling line and I've definitely worked the warehouse. I've definitely done the office work. I've done shows. I've done the tours. I've now do the distillation, now do the blending. Um, so uh, I've definitely seen all sides. Um, I've even swept the floors. <laughs> um, and yeah, and but uh, kind of a couple of years into this, um, we were looking to grow the distillery team. Um, Lisa Wicker, who was our pup, uh, previous president um, was kind of in charge of kind of reestablishing that and kind of growing it a bit. Uh, and we had talked a lot about my love of baking and discussing yeast. And I just thought she was an amazing resource of like information and, 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 and that kind of thing. So we talked a lot. And so she uh, offered me the job and she said, you know, there's, you know, a lot that you don't know, but it's stuff you can learn. The stuff you do know is impossible to teach. Um, and so that was kind of really amazing. Um, and I just started training and it kind of was true. There was a lot that it was just like, it just requires a lot of distillation is something that really requires a lot of intuition and, um, and a lot of, uh, just kind of common sense in a lot of ways. Um, because once you kind of see behind the kind of like curtain of Oz, um, it really kind of opens up this whole world. Um, and I've just been kind of learning ever since and it's, my appreciation for whiskey and the whiskey world and the people who make whiskey, the people who drink whiskey is just always constantly growing. Um, it's never, never stopped growing really. That's the fun in it. you right. You know, like it's, it's like every day is something new and like, it's, Amazing. it's like what makes it all so much fun. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's that old saying, like if you, if you think you know it all, you're the dumbest person in the room, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, we're always like chasing that, you know, trying to learn more. And like, that's how we make things better. I mean, that's like, why you came up with this new idea for baby Jane, right? It's like, and you're going to continue to come up with new ideas as you learn more and more. And it's just like, that's how you keep going. That's what kind of keeps us going. It's beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. no, it's definitely, it's definitely a world that I don't think I'll ever really tire of. I think there's always just room to, to grow. And, you know, there's, so, you know, so many small nuances to everything we do um, that you can learn new little tricks for and new, you can constantly explore. Like I have not only the way I cook, I'm always constantly kind of paying attention to that. Like even to this day, even though I'm still, I've been cooking baby Jane forever. I'm still every single time tasting the corners. It comes in, tasting the mash as it goes, you know, um, taking the same notes and taking the same logs and the same lists, you know, tasting the constantly watching the fermentation. Michelle can say I come in every weekend, um, to check on the fermentation. Um, to kind of smell it, to just look at it, stare at it, lobbing lay for a while, <laughs> um, check the temps. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and again, yeah, running bit, still know. every time. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, you know, it's like, you know, it's like flowers. You have to sit there and talk to it. It really helps it come along, you know? <laughs> I mean, if, um, if you didn't, yeah. if you didn't, we wouldn't have caviar on hot dogs, you know, exactly. like that's, yeah. that's learning and progressing. Exactly. Uh, you know, I want to ask you, have you had the, the hot dog martini. The what now? Have you seen about that? What? The hot dog martini. You're you're gonna need to elaborate on this right now, Sienna, please. Because clearly this oh. is news to both of us. Yeah. So I think if you Google it, you'll you'll see the article, but I think it, it might have been it was either like a punch drunk or an eater article or something like that, I think. They was talking about how someone is now doing like a hot dog martini, which I'm assuming I didn't really read too much into it. Um, as a vegetarian, it's not really <laughs> my area of expertise anymore, <laughs> but, um, yeah, something about like, I think they like literally soaked hot dogs in vodka. Uh, and then there's like a kind of relish quality finish and things. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, fuck that. we have no. a standing offer from our friends, friends at Arby's who make a, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, roast, I think it's a roast beef vodka and a French fry vodka. And oh, it's, yeah. it's, not a, it's the curly fry. Oh, vodka. excuse me. Yes, it's the curly oh, fry yeah. vodka. How dare you? Yes. But there's <laughs> the also, makes a difference. but there's also, there's also, uh, Gildan's, the mustard people do make a wine that is mustard infused. So that opens the possibility Ooh. of like an Arby's yes. Vesper. So okay. I have a standing offer to the good people right. at Arby's to publicly take back everything I've said about their beef adjacent protein slabs <laughs> if they send us some of their vodka and we will get them on the show. So if you're listening, everyone. Hey, man. Yeah. 
How about Nathan's? Nathan's, come on, get out on that hot dog vodka and we could, you know, whole new world. Yeah, seriously. Be, yeah. Or at least a tequila, we could throw mezcal, we could put some hot dogs in a, in a still and distill it like a pachuga, you know, <laughs> why not? Oh my God, that's amazing. You heard it here first, folks. I, you know, I, I like the idea of taking the mustard wine and like making a vermouth with it. I think that would be. Yeah. Work. I mean, I'd probably do mustard vermouth. There we go. That sounds good. Honestly, yes. I'm a little bit spicy. Did we did we yeah. just discover the new 10-year project that Widow Jane is going to embark on here? I mean, <laughs> got to keep a secret. Got to keep that. Yeah. It'll have to be a private barrel. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. Oh, my exclusively God. Exclusively served. That could be the next uh, Red Hook Rye, but it will be. We'll feature in our bar. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. This summer. Actually, I think I feel like rye would be a better platform for this than maybe bourbon. Yeah, the spicy mustard reserve. Yeah, I think that would, that would yeah. be good. Mm-hmm. We should talk to Billy Journey at uh, Red Hook Tavern and like get this going. You know, I'm sure like there's there's a collaborative thing that could happen here between yeah. you know. You hear us, Billy? Well, he's famous for his hamburgers though, which is like that's there's I beef know, there, literally beef there. <laughs> the hot dog yeah. people and the hamburger people. Um, you know, <laughs> so that's true. Yeah. Oh, man, so much to cover on our next show spinoff. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, I want to talk about like so the building is so beautiful. Like for the listeners, if you haven't been to Red Hook, Brooklyn, yeah, it is. Well, first of all, it's it's the greatest view of the Statue of Liberty, and that's mm-hmm. not to tie into right. a Fourth of July type thing. It just really is. Um, but the cool thing about Red Hook, one of the coolest things for me, and I lived there for four years or so before I moved to Carroll Gardens which is close enough. You can still walk, walk there, but that's kind of part of it. It's like you walk there, drive there, bike there. There's no, there's no train line that goes to Red Hook. And that's, what's kept it almost to a certain extent, kind of like a time capsule in a lot of ways. Cause I mean, I'm wearing the Sunny's sweatshirt. The Sunny's bar is like truly, you know, I, I have you noticed how many just like in social media and magazine, like, like photo shoots that take, place in front of Sonny's with the old truck with Sonny's old truck you know it, so yep. for the listeners out there there's this old pickup truck that like I think and again Red Hook is pretty outlaw like no one really fucks with it that truck never moves for like alternate side parking for like street cleaning that thing never moves so there's some sort of like grandfathered in deal that Sonny had I have no idea or I don't know. I feel like it's like no I feel like it's like a mob boss's Camaro. You know, it's like a bunch of yeah, Teslas exactly, in Bay yeah. Ridge that don't have to move for alternate side parking, and then that one beat up pickup truck in Red Hook. They're the only ones that are like unofficially yeah, exempt in totally. the whole city. Oh yeah, but the thing no, is, I mean, it's on a co- it's on a cobblestone street too. They have a second one now too. They do. Yeah. Yeah, they have like a brat- a slightly newer one in front. Yeah, I've seen that one. This is very telling because I was just at Sonny's like two weeks ago and I didn't notice it. So that's telling about the state that I rolled up to Sonny's in and the one that I subsequently yeah. left in that I did not see <laughs> that the truck had doubled. Yeah, that's the way that's the way it is with Sonny's. But it's you know it's it's a great it's a cool street. It's like the closest. It basically, it's the closest you can get to the water. Almost, you know, it's uh, it's on Conover, right? Yeah, and sometimes the water comes to you. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's this cobblestone street. I mean, Red Hook is astounding. Things. The port is right there. So they said Sunny's was the oldest bar in New York because it was the first building that when the port was very active uh, right a block away, that was the first building when the sailors hit land. So obviously it was far. Um, but Red Hook has been like one of the most dangerous neighborhoods for 30 years. Not so much, I think, lately, but... 30 years it was the most dangerous neighborhood in the state because it was inaccessible there was no right. uh, public transportation the water table was so high that um you know you can't dig to get the subway there so it became like a bit of a dead end that's why you always see film crews um shooting yeah. here because there's no through traffic um but it was established by the dutch um and queen elizabeth commissioned like the whole entire New York waterfront with these like warehouses in a certain style. So Red Hook is considered a historic neighborhood, not only for the cobblestone, which is preserved, but like these warehouses, which are um, maintained under, you know, historical expectations because Queen Elizabeth wanted to basically own, own the buildings that her exports were going into. Um, 
you know, there's been a big mafia hangout like Botanica, which has been like, is a beautiful space now. It was like a general store for the longest time. People actually came there for whiskey and Coffee Street. Uh, you'll hear about the ghosts of Coffee Street yep. because people used to come here and get um, white lightning uh, or moonshine and it was not uh, filtered well. So people were going blind and dying um, on Coffee what Street. Else? And so we just kept that tradition alive by yeah. bringing, you know, 2012, obviously everyone was getting their liquid licenses then because uh, it was the first time since Prohibition that you could open a new license in New York. So, and it was like the perfect, also kind of patchwork, but more accessible place to have a factory because it was mixed residential and manufacturer and industrial use. Um so this, the building I'm in right now was actually just a field and the bar was from 1898. And so we just like mimicked that uh, Dutch style of architecture and created a building that looked of the era by taking um, abandoned bricks from a schoolyard and creating this like refurbished brick, refurbished wood a style factory. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's kind of been a destination. Obviously it's a lot of artists have ended up here because where, you know, it's, it was the first like projects ever in the United States for the housing for the sailors. And so there's a lot of like warehouses and um, mixed housing and they've converted that to artist studios. Um, but yeah, then Ikea moved in. So yeah. well, there's that. Cause like they gentrified it a bit, but I think they were really <laughs> clever about it. Because they invested in the local bus system. Yeah. So suddenly you didn't have to wait for the B61 for two hours. Every 30 minutes, the B61 showed up. Then City Bike was like, well, we're riding on those coattails. We're going to have bike stations. And then Ikea also created the ferry, which the city then expanded along the whole waterfront. So now you could like just do a day trip. And all the Red Hook businesses are like mom and pop, you know, single ownership, uh, really unique. So you can spend a whole day here eating and drinking. There's breweries, there's wineries, there's other distilleries and all these wonderful places to eat. So come visit us. Totally. And you know what else is there? Pearl Street Caviar. So <laughs> get yourself a hot dog, take it to Red Hook, make it a fancy dog. Oh uh, you can get one at Ikea, my friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. Go out of Red Hook. Oh, perfect. We have yeah. everything you need here. Yeah. We got hot dogs, we got <laughs> caviar, we got whiskey. We're the real all American town. Yeah. Lingonberry sauce, whiskey jam, and caviar. This actually sounds that honestly oh we're, we're yeah, joking, that but that does sound like a pretty good hot dog. I mean No, I'm not joking. I'll see I never you joke. Fourth of July, I'll see you at uh <laughs> Cold Caviar. <laughs> I'll bring the whiskey, you bring the hot dogs. There we go. <laughs> perfect. I do want to say that about Red Hook though, because like, you know, it is like it's kind of like you know, it's, I, I'm glad you brought up the ferry because that is important. It, it became more accessible. But the thing I always loved about living there and like playing, my band would play at like Bait and Tackle or at Sonny's. Um, it's just like everyone shows that it's like such a community in Red Hook that like, it doesn't matter what's going on. Everyone shows up. And, yep. and that's unique for New York City. You know, it's, it's a lot of characters. A lot of salty, salty characters. I mean, like when I was working at Linnell's, like I met so many like interesting people. I met Michael Shannon. He, I think they still live there. Um, uh, uh, I don't think but anymore. maybe not anymore. Uh, Paul Dano was living there, and but then uh, Nick Offerman was like the. I met Nick Offerman when I was working at the whiskey shop before he became famous, and you know, his wife was Megan Mullally. And, like it was just a funny thing, and he was like the woodworking character that he played on. Uh, Parks and Recreation, like kind of all American dude speaking. I, that's actually a nice little ending segue. Um, <laughs> he actually came in the he came into the whiskey shop, and I had like Brian Eno playing, and he comes in, he's like, "Is this is this the new Ween album?" And I was like, "Just because you <laughs> thought it was Ween, I was like, you're cool enough already." And he was, I was like, "No, it's Brian Eno." And he was like, "Ah, that was my second guess." And then you know we started talking about like what he was doing there, and then. I go to see Young Frankenstein on Broadway, and then I'm in line during intermission to get a drink, and he comes up behind me. He's like, so, they got any good whiskey here? I turn around, I'm like, the fuck are you doing here? Because he's like this woodworking dude building a canoe down the street. And he's like, my wife's in the place. Like, oh, is she like one of the extras or something? He's like, no, she's the lead. And I was like, who the fuck are you? 
what we just never we we just talked about woodworking like help me out with building a guitar that i ended up staining with chartreuse back when you could do that um but he like you know it's just like that kind of place you know and it's just so cool and like it's it, i remember when widow jane came in and Caprietto and botanica and like it was just like all right this is cool but i was like i was a little nervous that it was going to change the neighborhood and start getting like like, I was like, no, now they're going to build a subway or like a, a light rail or above uh, ground or whatever to this neighborhood. And it's going to change. But the cool thing is it just it's only changed for the best. And it's become enriched with all this amazing stuff like Hometown Barbecue and uh, the Reddick Tavern. And, you know, like uh, even after like even going way back with Fort Defiance and like just really amazing stuff. But it kept it's kept the spirit of Red Hook. Other than IKEA, but <laughs> and that think, that was actually think, the longest pay, that was the longest cobblestone street in America, in, in the entirety of America before IKEA came in and changed it. But you know the thing is, you get you you're still on a really sweet one, uh, cobblestone street that is. So I don't know, it's just cool. I like it's awesome. Everyone should go visit you there. It's it's just it's a great experience. I've been there a couple times before and. I do think that like Red Hook will always forever, no matter how much we change, I think be a community of people where we all kind of like bond over feeling a bit like it's kind of us against the world a little bit, but in a way where it's like, you know, kind of brings us together and we can make, we want to like make the world better. Um, so yeah, you know, all those businesses you mentioned, like we're all great friends, like people on our staff play soft on our, on the softball team with hometown staff. And like, there's like a Red Hook, softball league that they're part of like we will always be this weird quirky uh kind of like small town america in red in new york like on the coast here but also like doing new york things like starting a distillery that during a time where big bourbon was telling us that whiskey couldn't come from anywhere but kentucky and all those kind of things so yeah that's all i had to say about that yeah, that's that's a great that's a great thing to say about Red Hook. I think that's I think that's amazing, and I think that's and it's one of the awesome things about uh, that neighborhood and about what the the work that you all are doing. And if our listeners wanted to keep up with uh, the cool stuff that you're doing and uh, potential future mustard based collaborations with the Speakeasy with the award winning Speakeasy podcast, <laughs> uh, where can they can they find you on the inter- on the interwebs? Widow Jane on Instagram, simple. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter that we're launching this month. And honestly, the best, you know, you can always email info at widowjane.com. Most of us get that. Um, but we're open seven days a week. So come visit. There's a different thing going on every day, like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have a bar that when we were shut during COVID for a year, I used that time to like completely renovate it and made all custom furniture and like a whiskey library and vault. Um, and we relaunched um, this kind of like very high end space with this like really beautiful seasonal menu. So Friday, Saturday and Sunday, you can check that out. And then tours are going on next door um, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday as well. And then we're doing production during the week. If you want to get your hands dirty. <laughs> is that, is that a serious course. offer? Can we come in and, and just, you know, shovel some, shovel some mash for a little bit? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll have to like interview you. We have to like see how your handwriting is. It's oh, very important. Um, you have to have still toe boots. All right. Done. But we get a lot of barrels that need to be rolled around from facility to facility. Cause we're like pa- a patchwork facility a bit. Not everything's into one building. We're like a few blocks away from our facilities, so we're hiring right now. I wonder if that's if that's the secret, kind of like how you know uh, Lenny Aquavit is on ships that pass the equator twice. I'm, is that? I wonder how. I would love. I would obviously. There's no way to quantify this because distilling is, as you both said, is both an art and a science. But I wonder if like rolling those barrels down the bumpy street does add that special like Widow Jane. Oh yeah, on there. I mean we we almost like sonificate. Sonic. Oh my god, that's not human language. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the 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 idea of playing music into the rick houses to kind of vibrate them that way. I don't really uh, always say that we like to aerate our, our whiskey with the rattling of driving a forklift over cobblestones, <laughs> for sure. I think you Definitely should like plays. spin the story like they, they crossed the BQE twice <laughs> in the back of Sonny's truck. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm so glad that you were on the show today. Uh, I can't wait to try it. I didn't get a sample bottle yet of it, the baby Jane, but I, I hope I get it in the mail uh, soon so I can celebrate the 4th of July in style with my hot dog and with some baby Jane. So oh, yes. thanks again, Michelle and Sienna, for being on the show today. Check out widowjane.com is the website. Widow Jane's on social media. And, uh, well, uh, till we meet again and have some whiskey and some hot dogs together. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. So you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.